I want to talk about the, some of the general issues about technology and learning that we usually don't have time to think about in higher education. And in order to do that, I'm going to share with you some projects that have recently been completed, many of which have nothing much to do with higher education. But I'm on a continual quest for looking across different age phases, across different subject content and so on, to see what it is that we can generalize. Are there some lessons or principles for the design of digital technologies that make it good for learning? And if so, can't we find ways to describe those technologies so that we benefit from each other's efforts? Very interesting sitting reading the booklet at some of the really stunning examples of using technology that's going on in this university. But, and I'm, perhaps I shouldn't say but, and, it's equally stunning that each one has its own, looks to me like its own theoretical background, its own rationale, its own deep connection with the content involved, which is understandable. So I'm going to talk for a relatively short time and then, at least that's the plan, never quite works out that way, um, and leave at least 15 minutes if I can for questions and discussion, just to see if I've succeeded in reorienting some thoughts from the particular, how am I going to use technology to teach my course next year with my second year undergraduates, to the more general, what can I say, what can I learn from lessons that are currently being learned about the use of technology in the broader sphere of learning. That means that I'm going to have to ask for your indulgence. One or two of the examples I give might be for very young children, but even, even your undergraduates used to be very young children, I conjecture. So, um, yeah, you'll have to be patient with me for that. So this is a statue of Gandhi in the square next to my university. And shortly after the Second World War, Gandhi visited London. And uh, the BBC interviewed him and said, what do you think of Western civilization, Mr. Gandhi? And Gandhi said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> Um, and it, 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 what do you think of technology enhanced learning? Well, as I say, there are lots and lots of really stunning examples of people thinking deeply about how to use technology, but for the most part, now this is where I'm starting to tread on dangerous ground, but it's going to get much more dangerous before I finish. Um, for the most part, we are still at that phase of introducing a new technology, and it happened with TV, and it happened with any technology you can think of. We're still at the stage of recapitulating what we used to do, but doing it more effectively, more quickly, more efficiently, and so on, which is absolutely fine. But we're not at the stage, in most of our working lives, I don't think, in universities and schools and colleges, we're not at the stage where we can really say, this technology has been life-changing for the people we're using it with. If you think of the way we all use technology as individuals, and the way that, say, uh, text messaging has changed the way our whole social lives are different now because of text messaging. You know, it, used to, it used to be unthinkable to say, I'll meet you in the bull ring at half past five. I'll meet you at Piccadilly Circus at 8 o'clock. But now, that's, that's what everybody does, and then when you get there, you text and say, I'm underneath the clock tower or somewhere. So everyday technologies that are in our pocket have fundamentally changed the way we do things and the way we think about things. Not always for the better. Um, but I really don't believe, and this is the first point you might want to take up as a contentious point with me after I've finished, I don't think that we're at the stage in education of saying technology has fundamentally realigned the balance between teaching and learning, fundamentally changed what people learn, fundamentally changed how they learn. Although, as I keep saying, um, there are some wonderful examples of that. Come and sit down, don't worry. <laughs> I should just draw attention to the fact that you're late. <laughs> Um, okay, so the challenge is to explore the relationship between tools, learning, and knowledge. 
I think it's obvious that if you have more powerful tools, you can help people learn what they need to learn more effectively. At least you can if you spend a great deal of time and energy and money designing tools that have that effect. One of the issues that is very, very little discussed is the knowledge itself becomes transformed. So I'm a mathematician by training, so I only dare to talk about mathematics, but surprisingly to me, who was told when I was an undergraduate that only wimps and bad mathematicians use computers, surprisingly now, the face of mathematics, some areas of mathematics, has been completely transformed by technology. Not just the way people do mathematics research, but what they do research about. There are some questions that have actually only become tractable because we have technology. And that's surprisingly in pure mathematics as well as in applied mathematics. Now, I suspect that that must be true for nearly everybody in this room. But what we tend to focus on is not so much what the knowledge is, but how we can present that knowledge, as if the knowledge stays the same across the two cases. And it really isn't like that, is it? In your research area, the advent of ubiquitous technology has almost certainly changed the subject matter. But for the most part, and it's certainly true in mathematics, we still teach the same stuff as we taught before the technology was ubiquitous. So I want to spend a little bit of time in the next half hour talking not only about how technology might change the way we teach and the way people learn what we teach, but what is taught and what becomes possible for people to learn that was essentially impossible before. Well, I say impossible. Impossible is a strong word. Very difficult, very problematic. And um, it's the knowledge itself, the transformation of knowledge itself that I want to focus on here today. And here's what I, I'm going to give you an, an analogy. I don't know how many people went to the David Hockney exhibition uh, at the Royal Academy last year. You, you don't need to have gone, but I just want to describe my experience. Um, these were watercolours and they weren't of Los Angeles swimming pools. They were of the British countryside, really quite stunning stuff. And I went with my son and I wandered into one of the rooms and I noticed a couple of things about the room. It was fantastically full and there was a huge number of paintings on the wall, much greater density of paintings than there were in the rest of the exhibition. And I vaguely now, with hindsight, remember thinking there's something slightly different about these paintings to the ones before, but I know very little about painting. Uh, and um, it didn't really crystallise in my mind what I, was, what I was thinking about it. And then my son came over to me and said, God, how could you imagine doing all these with an iPad? And this room was full of 80 paintings done with an iPad. And the analogy I want to make is that I don't really know what was different about them, but I, I'm absolutely sure, I left the exhibition absolutely sure that it wasn't just the means by which paint, in the broadest sense of paint, was applied to the canvas. Obviously, there's no paint or canvas if you're doing it on an iPad. It wasn't just the way it was done, but it was what resulted in the end. And then I found that Hockney himself had written about this, and he says, there are gains and losses with everything. You miss the resistance of paint. Unless you're an artist, this means very little to you, I suspect. It means very little to me. You miss the resistance of paper, but you can get a marvellous flow. So much variety is possible. You can't overwork this because it's not a real surface in watercolour, and so on. Beyond that, it starts to get muddy. Fantastic use of language for what's going on on an iPad. But the point is, are there any art, artists here, actually? Because at this point, you could take over the lecture. With, <laughs> um, uh, I don't really understand at any kind of deep level what Hockney is talking about, except for one thing seems clear. He's describing not a difference in the process of painting so much as a difference in what is painted. So the viewer has a different experience that is intimately bound up with his experience of putting the quotes paint on quotes paper. And 
I think it's that kind of deep engagement with the technology that changes the nature of what it is that's being studied, or in this case, presented to an audience, that is an analogy worth pursuing a little bit. OK, so let's get to a slide that nobody will be able to read. Even I can't read it, actually. It's, it's, uh, um, this slide really says, Richard, don't forget to give credits. <coughs> so let me just give you the framework which is going to uh, be hinged around what I say. We've just come out of a, a, a generously funded teaching and learning research program called the Technology Enhanced Learning Research Program, which was a 12 million pound research funded by the EPSRC and the ESRC. It was extraordinary for that collaboration because it's very hard to get social scientists to understand that they have to also be funded for people to design technology. And it's even harder to get computer scientists to understand that they have to mess around with these soft education type people <laughs> who don't really know anything about anything much. That's why they're teachers. Um, I hope they are. I hope, just in case this is being recorded and transcribed, it says here brackets irony. Okay. <laughs> um, but this was a four and a half year program of research. There were eight major research projects. The small print that you can't read is the names of the projects, that, some of which I'm going to refer to in a minute. Um, but the uh, program in, involves 30-something universities, 400-plus researchers, 500 research papers now published on the web, and the URL, which you can instantly forget, is telltechnologyenhancedlearning.ac.uk. That doesn't mean that you're allowed to access the URL now. <laughs> but, um, so this is a great opportunity for people like me who are interested in the intersection between learning, teaching, tools, and technology. Um, and I was very lucky to be the director of the program, which means that you probably shouldn't pester me for the example that you like best. You should pester the... Uh, principal investigator of that program, obviously, again, on the URL. Okay, so what we did as, as the out, one of the outcomes of this program of research, which, by the way, spanned all age phases and lots of different kinds of technologies and lots of different methodologies as well. Um, it's quite salutary to try and get social scientists and computer scientists to talk to each other in a language that they mutually understand. And I, on my optimistic days, I think that the struggle to make that happen was worthwhile. On my less optimistic days, I sometimes think maybe we should have just let, let each community get on with what they do best. But um, it is a challenge, a quite an interesting challenge, and it certainly did lead, in ways that I won't elaborate here, did lead to some research outcomes being, I think, quite different from what they would have looked like had we had our own closed silos around what we did. Um, we wrote a report at the end of the program called System Upgrade, which was the brief that we got from the ESRC and the EPSRC was, this has to be understandable even by politicians. And that's a challenge. Um, there are some politicians who will understand what you say to them. But it led us to think, are, what are, are there some overarching considerations, some lessons that we learned from this program of research that we could talk, joking aside, not so much to politicians, but to the people who pay politicians' salaries, which is us. Um, after all, almost all of us use technologies that we had no part in designing of any kind. Um, you know, the technology that's changed everybody here's life most is probably Word. Um, a shocking story told to me, actually, by somebody who used to work at the University of Birmingham was a visit from Microsoft to the department that he worked in. And they all sat around to discuss the design of the next generation of, of uh, word processing. And like you do, you sit around having mad ideas and somebody said, it'd be great if we had a facility to do this, and a great, if, if only, I often think when I'm using Word, it, why is it that when you delete the, 
first character of a paragraph, it inherits the properties of the... You, you ought to be able to choose a very detailed... And then there was this shocking moment of silence, and the guy from Microsoft said, yeah, I think we'll implement all those. <laughs> and so you've, you've all had this experience. There are eight billion different things you can do with Word, of which you ever use six. <laughs> um, and that's because the people who designed Word don't, haven't really stopped. They're obviously brilliant people. Microsoft wouldn't be, whatever you think about Microsoft, they wouldn't be as rich as they are unless they had some brilliant people. But what it doesn't happen is anybody saying, let's make a version of Word that is specially good for X. And in our case, X is teaching and learning. Um, so we thought it would be nice if we could abstract from the minutiae of individual research projects. And I'm, I guess that you can hardly read those uh, words, but I just wanted to flag that we ended up with 12 big ideas that you might be interested to follow up at some point. And the first of those ideas is the idea of connection. So here I'm probably mostly thinking about school children, but school children become university students, as I said. And we do a strange thing in school education. We've been waiting for 35 or 40 years. People like me have been waiting for 40 years for the point at which technology, access to technology becomes unproblematic for our students. You know, we used to have... Few, it, actually, this is really going to show my age, but in 1974, when the first electronic calculator was produced, handheld electronic calculator was produced, I went to a conference of mathematicians, mathematicians and math teachers, I think it was, and there was one subject for debate, which was, Will there ever be a time when a school could afford a whole classroom full of calculators? <laughs> um, so we've been waiting all those years for it to be just unproblematic that computers exist and that everybody knows how to use them. And now we have that situation. Every kid has a smartphone in their pocket. And what schools do is they say, as you enter the school, turn it off for very understandable reasons. I'm not in any way deriding the wish for teachers and lecturers to have peaceful lectures and peaceful <coughs> lessons. But it is a little odd. And I find myself guilty. Actually, I, I made a joke about it 10 minutes ago, but it's true. If you were all tweeting now, I once went to a lecture where the tweets were uh, available, and one of them, I wasn't the speaker, and one of the tweets said, oh, God, not the same old stuff. <laughs> and it's just, it, that's the equivalent of the, of the kids texting each other in the back of your school lesson, isn't it? But we are at this very odd moment, I think, where, I mean, how many iPads are there in this room? Can you put your hand up if you've got an iPad in front of you? Yeah, that, that is just the stunning thing that's happened. I, I'm not advertising for Apple here. <laughs> well, not really. Um, it, it, you see, <laughs> thank you, I'll, I'll pay you what I promised you after the lecture. Okay, well that point's been made quite well, hasn't it? Um, this is a project called the Personal Inquiry Project, which took a step along the line of saying, we have these ubiquitous technologies, what can we do? So for example, I hadn't put together in my mind the fact that this phone and probably nearly everybody else's phone. By the way, is there anybody in this room who doesn't own a mobile phone? No. Okay, well done. <laughs> Which planet are you from? <laughs> okay, but that's not bad, is it? So we have these machines, they have accelerometers in them, and they have all kinds of things in, hidden inside them. And you've heard a million times that there's more power in an iPhone than there was in the total computing effort that sent a man to the moon. We know that, but we don't know how to harness it. We don't know how to use it. Um, so the Personal Inquiry Project was an interesting project uh, which said, let's give kids useful scientific things to do with the technologies that they already have in their pockets. Uh, and it led to some very interesting results. There are some associated results now that are beginning to come online. For example, 
Anybody here seen Galaxy Zoo? It's this, it's this astonishing, nothing to do with this particular project, but along the same lines of citizen scientists. So hundreds of thousands of people go into their back gardens every night with a cheap telescope and participate in this very interesting website called Galaxy Zoo. And every now and then, somebody discovers a really interesting scientific phenomenon which the scientists who are involved in Galaxy Zoo uh, hang on to. And it's resulted in the classification of several new stars. And as far as I understand it, even one particular configuration of stars that I don't understand, but which was discovered by Joe Bloggs in his back garden one night. So we, we, we have situations where, for all the useless bloggings and sexting and disastrous consequences of the use of technology that we all know about and read about and so on, and do exist, and I'm not belittling them in any way, but we do see these little oases of really deep engagement with ideas, in, this, in the case I just said, scientific ideas, um, and we see that deep engagement as being mediated by and made possible by technology. And just in case we have some social scientists here who are ready to pounce on me for my technological determinism because I say things like, the technology has made it possible for. I know that argument, it's the right argument, but I'm a secret technological determinist. Uh, it, there just are things that technology lets you do that you can't do without the technology, and they have changed the way we think and learn. And of course, from the learning point of view, it's how you use the technology and the culture and the communities into which that technology is inserted, which makes a difference, not the technology itself. But that doesn't stop us marvelling at what could become possible if we, if we designed technology specifically for the jobs that we do. Um, so here's the big overarching question that might be question one if there's time at the end. Uh, how do personal and consumer devices change the relationship between formal and informal learning? And if you don't like the abstraction of that question, how can we put to good use the fact that our students would rather text each other than listen to us? Um, I, we're beginning to see examples of that. I'll say something about the MOOC phenomenon later on. If I, well, I'm, I won't if I can avoid it, but I bet I can't avoid it. Um, so that's one question. Um, I think that social networking gives us a clue into a very important thing that's happened, which is that we, we've all mouthed a kind of ritualistic way, I think, or I certainly have, that collaboration is a good form of learning. And I've come to realise that collaborative learning can be very powerful but the tools that one uses for collaboration really do have a huge effect on whether or not that collaboration, what that collaboration looks like and whether that collaboration turns out to be good for learning. So it's really easy. You can all make up scenarios of collaborative learning that are absolutely useless for learning. Like, for example, I, I, I think that you probably know more about at some subject than me, and I let you do all the work, and I call that a collaboration, that'd be great. Um, but that's not very good for me. It might be good for you to teach me, but it wouldn't be great in general. Um, but I think that what we're beginning to see is that technology has the possibility of changing the nature of collaboration, and therefore what comes out of that collaboration. So this is a project called SynergyNet, in which Imagine iPads that are this big, and imagine that they're to networked together very seamlessly, and you can pick something up. There isn't a language for what you really do, but you, know, you pick something. Has anybody, have you all seen the YouTube video of the two-year-old kid trying to resize a picture in his book? <laughs> Why did I suddenly tell you that? Um, <laughs> No, but the, the, the nature of collaboration is changing now. So I think asynchronous collaboration is potentially more powerful than synchronous collaboration. Synchronous collaboration is great if you say, I'm underneath the, clock, the, I'm underneath the main advertising hoarding in Leicester Square, that's great. 
But if you want to reflect on a piece of knowledge that is difficult, that you have to delve into, that you have to bring diverse <coughs> sources, then actually asynchronous communication is often much more powerful. So this is a project, as I say, with giant iPads. So you can pick things up from one iPad and move them across to your friend over there. Or the teacher can intercept it and say, let's all have a look and see what's happened here. Now that would be a really great, this, is, this happened to be a project with little tiny kids doing very elementary stuff. But actually we're very close, and we're beginning to see some real instances of it happening, mainly in the States, I think. But just imagine that you're giving your lecture in whatever your subject is, and you can take for granted, as we nearly can in this room, we're not far away, take it for granted that everybody has an iPad, and that I could point at you and say, Look, can you send me your version or your vision of what it is that's going on here, and you just slide it across to me, I can project it onto the screen. The, you know, the possibilities are very interesting I'm not a futurologist. I, 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 there are people who can do this much better than me. But I do think that the lesson is twofold. One, the technology can potentially change the way we think about the knowledge that we're teaching. And secondly, we're hideously close to being able to do really good things, but we have to intervene in the process. People like us, everybody in this room, has to try, we have to find as many channels as we can to have a voice for the designers, because nobody designs anything for education. That's the problem that we all have, that we're using the offshoots of technologies that are for other purposes. And I see that fantastically clearly in my own subject, because there are some s simply stunning uh, tools for mathematicians to use, and they are just absolutely perfectly tuned for mathematicians to use them but they're not perfectly tuned for mathematics teachers and mathematics lecturers to use with their students who are not gifted in mathematics. And I'm sure if it's true for mathematics, you might say that maths is a special case of something, but um, if it's true for mathematics, it's true more generally. So the general point I want to make about that is that let's not only ask, can I use technology to help people collaborate more effectively but are there new forms of collaboration around which I could use because I would want to introduce people to new forms of, of content, new forms of material? Well, one of the things that's happening any second now is that we'll all be communicating with our computers in completely different ways. In fact, the computers themselves will sink into the background. As a matter of fact, the iPad was probably the um, first living example we had. I mean, the definition of a portable computer for me was one that you, you're not sure if you've got it in your backpack or not, because it's so little and so light. So that's nearly true for my iPad here, I told, for my um, MacBook Air, but I'm not advertising for Apple, remember? <laughs> um, but now it really is true. Uh, you can leave home thinking you've got it in your backpack and it isn't in your backpack because it is so insignificant as a thing. So we all read in the papers about wearable and shareable technologies and Google Glass. Why it's called Google Glass and not Google Glasses, I don't know, but they really insist on it. Um, we will have eye tracking next year in the next generation of laptops, so the laptops will have some inkling of what we're doing with our eyes. Uh, you can already well, that's an important thing to be able to do if you're trying to read and adapt to what the learner is thinking. These are very deep things, you know. These are things that only teachers could ever hope to do, to adapt what they say and do to what they think people are thinking about what they're saying. I mean, think of the complexity of that. So any help we can get from the technology would be great. We don't get much help from the technology yet. Um, but... We do have lots of now commonplace examples of people interacting with technology in ways other than the, the keyboard and mouse. Uh, the Haptel project was very interesting, actually. It started off really looking at a, what you might think is a mundane problem, which is how can the dentist school at King's College London um, teach its thousands of students that go through every year 
probably, no, high hundreds, I'd probably mean, um, to drill teeth more effectively. And it was a very humdrum problem. The teeth are very expensive. You're not allowed to use human teeth. It's a very difficult thing to do. So let's build a haptic device that's sensitive to touch, that, understand, that, that really gives the students the feeling of doing the real thing, but not the real thing. And they spent the first year really putting all their effort into... Um, you, by the way, they built this system that was so realistic, it had that horrible drilling noise. <laughs> and I, in the end, I, did, I had to visit this project twice a year to make sure things were on track. I, they were always on track, but that was my, I, that's what I was supposed to do. And we had a deal that I would say nice things about them if they, didn't, if they could switch the noise off <laughs> when they were demonstrating. Um, there's something about that noise that is just horrific. But um, they spent the first year obsessed with the fidelity of the system they were building. So the, the theory went like this. We want, we, ideally, we'd like nice, pliant human beings to lie still with their mouth open and you practice on them. Well, we're not going to get that. So if you're going to do it with technology, you want to mirror that context as accurately as you possibly can. And then they had people like me coming and saying, but is that really what you want to do? I mean, aren't you missing a, a, a trick here? Wouldn't it be great if there were things that you could do that you couldn't do to a real patient? And slowly the enterprise changed from being, how can we be faithfully representing what would happen if we didn't have the technology, to changing it to, now that we have the technology, what are the things that we can do that might lead to deep learning which might not be possible with a real patient, but which will generate deep learning, conceptual understanding, not just procedural competence, um, in ways that wouldn't be possible without the technology. And I think that shift for me in this particular project was in a way indicative of the general shift that I'm talking about. To start by saying, let's do what we always did, but do it better. To say, no, look, there are things that we can do now that really will change what it is possible to learn. So for example, an obvious thing you can do if you're, drilling, if you're drilling an artificial tooth on a computer is that when you finish, the computer can tell you how well you did. Or it can say, would you like to rerun what you did so you can concentrate on seeing the mistakes you made? Um, or you can say, would you like to have a view behind the tooth where it's impossible for you to see in a real tooth and see what damage you've done um, no, but seriously, I mean, that, that's a really good example of how seeing more than, is, than was possible before might, in ways that I don't begin to understand for dentistry, but I think, I think there is a, a, a general lesson here. It might really change not just how we teach, but what we teach. And so the general lesson there is how do different ways of interacting in the jargon learning modalities um, change what can realistically be taught and learned. And in the broader sphere, beyond uh, Russell Group Universities, I think that's a fantastically interesting question because not everybody wants to interact with their computer with a keyboard and a mouse. The way people interact... Have you ever wondered why people under 15, they don't actually interact with a computer in the way that we do? Um, have you seen people sending, little people sending text messages to each other with two thumbs faster than I can type with ten fingers? <laughs> um, so I, I think actually keyboards and mice, mice were fantastically revolutionary when they were invented. But I think we're getting to the end of the keyboard and mouse life cycle. And um, as I say, technology that can read what you're, what you're doing, what, where you're pointing, where you're looking. I'll say something a bit more about that in just a second actually are really changing what's possible. This is the project that is closest to the obvious interests of the people in this room. This is the learning designer project that was led by my colleague in the London Knowledge Lab, Diana Lorillard. And she started from the following premise. If you're a mathematician, you have tools that were purpose designed to help you do mathematics. If you're a teacher of English literature, you have technologies that might really help you in, in helping other people, helping you to do an analysis of Macbeth, but they're not necessarily tuned to helping you teach Macbeth. 
So why is it that the tools that we have as lecturers in universities really aren't purpose-tuned like power tools? Why are we still at the level of hand-turning screwdrivers when there are power tools that we could design that would really help us? And the Learning Designer product, Project is an interesting project for lots of different reasons. One is that it starts from the premise that the last thing you want to do to university lecturers is give them even more time-consuming things that they haven't got time to do. So the first thing about the learning design of software is that it fits relatively seamlessly into the background of what we all do already. We prepare our lectures, we have to have notes, we worry about the references and so on. Secondly, it's premised on the fact that we're all doing versions of the same thing and we don't have enough time to talk to each other, especially across subject boundaries. And it's the subject boundaries that are really very difficult to cross uh, for, for obvious reasons. We don't work in the same buildings and we have different methodologies. And it's a very different thing. Learning a, a theorem of group theory is a different thing from learning about Macbeth. And are there any levels of abstraction at which there is something the same that we could say and tools that could help us across the subject divisions? And it's not obvious that the answer is yes. One of the, because the differences between subjects are just too great. One of the interesting things about her project, Diana's project, is that one of the research aims wasn't only to build tools that solve this problem, because that's always a nice thing to try and do, especially if you're being funded to do it, um, but to say the process by which we try to achieve that layer of, of abstraction so that there is a commonality and there is a sameness that would help us design power tools for teaching. Um, is there such a layer? If there is such a layer, then let's solve the problem of building tools. So the problem of tool building actually fed into the more theoretical questions of what was the same about subject material, and then reciprocally asking the question what was the same about subject material helped the computer science people working on the project to build tools that would solve that problem. So again, I'm not going to say much else about this particular project, but you can see the dialectic I'm setting up here. You, you use your intuitions and theories insofar as they exist about teaching and learning to think about what tools would look like if you could build them. And then in the process of trying to build those tools, you learn more and become more articulate about what the problem really is and what the level of abstraction is that you're really striving for. I think that's a really interesting point and it comes, of course, thank you ESRC and EPSRC. It was made possible because we had this collaboration between computer science and the learning sciences. So that's the lesson for that. And it's really at its infancy, you know. Okay, here's the point that I can't resist saying a word about MOOCs. Uh, because I know that if I don't say anything about MOOCs, you're going to ask anyway. And I know that Birmingham is involved in a MOOC. I, I know all those things, and I'm going to be really curmudgeonly now which is, it's great, let's go massive, let's go online, let's go open, although it won't be open for long. Um, but can we please remember that just opening our files to the world and making little, hundreds of little videos of us doing what we always did before is the first step only. And we know so much now about how people really learn and we know so much about the kinds of tools that help them learn that we have to fight to maintain that knowledge and not just collapse now that we've got the new technology. Well, it's actually the Open University has been doing it for 40 years, actually. But still, newish sort of technology, completely dominated by our cousins across the Atlantic and doing pedagogically stuff that is just not exploiting the technology that we have available and therefore the potential for learning that we had available. Okay, stop. Richard, you're ranting. <laughs> um, I can't resist saying a word about uh, at least one or two of the projects that were focusing on people who find it hard to learn for different reasons. Um, the Interlife project 
was interesting because it dealt with an emotional issue, not a cognitive issue. I mean, for obvious reasons, we're all in the business of helping people understand stuff. And we often don't have time, unless we're personal tutors and so on, we don't have time to consider the non-cognitive, affective areas of learning, you know, just what makes people learn, how they feel about themselves, how do they feel about each other, how do they feel about themselves as learners. And I think those issues are interesting and they are important and we know from the literature on learning that they're absolutely critical. And we don't get much help from technology in this area. Uh, the Interlife Project was interesting because it noted, it started from the noticing that um, People have great trouble with life transitions, in particular the transition between school and university. So everybody here has, has met people. By the way, when I went to a graduate school, I didn't have undergraduates anymore, I thought that's going to be great. By the time I get them, they'll have their children and they'll all be married and it'll all be all right. And they'll have some... It gets worse, <laughs> actually. I, I, I've lost track of the 50-year-old people in my office doing PhDs bursting into tears when they look <laughs> at me. Um, but joking apart, you know, affect, it's true for all of us. So you don't need to go much further than yourself to realise that the way you feel about learning has had a fantastic influence on what you learn. And the fact that most of us felt really good about some of the things we learnt, good enough to actually become lecturers and professors and so on, is itself an interesting point. I mean, what is it about us that made us feel good about learning when we know that so many millions and even billions of people feel bad about themselves as learners. So the Interlife Project was interesting. Um, it built a system in which people could, without any risk to themselves, I don't mean real risk, I mean emotional risk, collaborate with each other and share the way they felt in Second Life, uh, becoming people that they were only partially responsible for. You know how in Second Life you can become a rabbit or something. You can, people don't know who you are. So you can put just as much of your own psyche into the avatar as you want to. And you, know, you can stop when you don't feel safe. I once actually met somebody who just started life at the Interlife Project. And um, she rushed up to me and shook my hand and said, it was so nice meeting you the other day. And I said, but I, we haven't met before. She said, no, yes, we have. I was the blue rabbit in the corner. <laughs> That's actually true, um, but not terribly helpful. Um, I just want to say a word about artificial intelligence. The um, project was called Echoes, and it had this fantastic objective. Uh, it's kind of mind-bogglingly wonderful, if, it, if only it works, um, which is the... As you know, some very surprisingly high percentage of the population is somewhere on the autistic spectrum. Uh, and in any classroom of 30 people, whatever their age, you probably have two or three people who are on that spectrum. And the hypothesis is, well, and, and the problem, as you know, is that all of us have to find ways of communicating with other people and reading up people's signals and body language and so on. And people on the autistic spectrum find that much more difficult than people who are... It's so difficult finding the words here. You're not allowed to say normal, but at, at the end of the spectrum. Um, and the, th the theory is, if we build a system with an intermediating character a character, an agent on the screen who can communicate and understand something about the person who's interacting with the system, then the, the person can interact with the agent and then catalyze his or her interaction with human beings through that. So learning about what it takes to communicate and why pointing and eye movement and body movement, the roles that those movements and, and embodiments play, um, somehow um, are used by the individual to catalyse communication with other human beings. I think it's actually such a daring hypothesis. And my colleague, Kashka paraiska pompster who's working on this project, would be the first to say they've only taken the first small step. But I, I think what we have seen from this project and hundreds of other projects around the world um, is that at last the 
50 or 60 years of artificial intelligence research is finding its way wheedling into what we can use for teaching and learning. And our stereotypes of artificial intelligence, you know, it's... Of course, artificial intelligence is being used mostly for the most frightful things. So if you want to know where artificial intelligence is really at its peak, go and see how they drop bombs in Iraq without human intervention. I mean, I, I, it's obvious that technologies of all kinds can be used for good and bad things. But it's all, less obvious, but nevertheless promising. That if we, as we begin to understand more about how human beings learn, we can understand ways that it makes sense to make computers learn to help human beings learn. And the ECHOES project is trying to do that, for, mostly for young children on the autistic spectrum, but again, you can see shadows, I think, of what's happening in this project with what will happen more generally. How am I doing for time? About five minutes left on the clock. Okay, in that case, I'm going to skip a couple of slides. Uh, and I'm going to just tell you one last thing, because it's a, my, this is a project that I was involved in. And it's called the MyGen Project. Now, this was aimed at 14-year-old school children, so I know that you'll, you'll immediately say this has nothing to do with us, but it is something to do with you. Because if you were a mathematician, there must be some mathematicians here. You, mathematicians, they won't make you put your hand up. But you all know what I mean by that uncomfortable moment where you're sitting in a party and somebody says, what do you do? And you say, you're a mathematician. And then they say, oh, I was so bad at math. I never could do that. <laughs> and you think, yes, OK, join the club. And then they say, as if it, they're the first person to ever say it in their lives, but you know, I was really good at maths when I was at primary school. And I got to secondary school, and I don't know what happened, but it was just terrible. And in this country, at least, that's perfectly OK. It isn't OK to sidle up to somebody at a party and say, I'd never heard of Shakespeare. How interesting. Tell me who he is. But it is okay to say, I have absolutely no idea what algebra is about because I was asleep during that lesson or I had flu when they did algebra at school. So. Okay, but there is a lesson to this. So here's the short thing. We built a system to re-represent algebraic thinking for kids. Details, I'm not going to give you any. How we did it, I'm not going to give you any. It was saying, we were saying to ourselves, if algebra in the traditional sense, x, y's and z's and learning how to manipulate them and take things across the equal sign and all those things, I'm talking about school algebra now, not abstract algebra. Um, if that was so difficult for people, maybe we could represent those ideas in a different way. Because what algebra is about, and this does connect, I think, with other subjects, it looks as if it's about how you juggle x, y's and z's. But what it's really about is this incredible breakthrough in human history where you not only can label something that you don't know the value of, but you can manipulate it and bring it into existence with other things. So inve inventing the idea of x was a brilliant idea. Inventing the idea of x plus 3 was an even more brilliant idea. But we suddenly realised that what we were really trying to do is get people to think about generalisation and that the playing around with the letters was a secondary objective, an important one, but not the whole story. And so we coined the slogan, algebra is not a good way to learn algebra. So that's algebra as if it's just, if only you can understand what to do with the x's and y's, is not necessarily the only way, it's not a good way to learn about the really important thing about algebra, which is that you can generalise and you can think about unknown things and make, make headway about those things. Um, I'm going to skip the detail, but you see how that really meshes with the Hockney example. Uh, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you why it does. Because the point is, we found new ways to represent what it was we really were trying to do, and ended up inventing a new kind of algebraic representation. So it wasn't so much that we were making it easier to solve equations. That's something that mathematicians have to do and it's something that mathematics teaching has to be about. But we were putting our finger, trying to put our finger on something deeper level and thus change what it was that we were trying to teach. Just like Hockney had a different tool that he could use to represent what he was trying to say um, and in doing so, it was introducing us to a, a new kind of landscape, a new kind of 
way of seeing. Well, I've probably been a bit quick on that, so I'm going to finish with something really frivolous. Have I got two minutes? We did a project, I, I, looking back, I think it was the most successful project we ever did. We did a project with little tiny kids uh, making their own video games in a computer programming language where you didn't need text at all. Uh, and then we thought, God, this has gone well. We had six-year-olds doing this. Uh, and we thought, I wonder if we could get people to do outrageously difficult things. So we thought, what's the most ridiculous thing we can do? Well, we were mathematicians, so we thought of something really ridiculous. We thought it'd be great to have 13 and 14-year-old kids asking themselves ridiculously deep and difficult questions in mathematics. Like, the mathematicians here, I know who you are because you've been nodding at me. <laughs> um, like, you take all the positive integers in the whole world, wide world, you see, I'm talking to you as if you're only 12. Take all the positive integers in the whole world and think about how many there are. You don't have to answer how many there are. Lots, right? And then you take away all the even ones. Are there more now or less now or the same amount now? Now, only a mathematician can get this right because the definition of what it means to be right about this question only really emerged 200 years ago and we, most of what we teach our kids is, is more than that old. Um, but we thought, what do we really need to do? And we, we've thought about what, is it, what are the things that young children find really difficult? Well, it turns out that one of the things that kids find very, very hard, and adults too, is decimals. People don't really have a sense of what 3.1415926, what's that six really mean? Um, and they don't have a sense that as you go further along, the value of the digit gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And a huge percentage of people, try this next time you're going through New Street Station, say to people, um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about everything you know about decimals. And you give, the, give them the following problem. Which is bigger, 3.216 or 3.2168? And they'll say, any, oh no, 3.217 or 3.2168? And they'll say, the second one is bigger because it has more digits. No, seriously, there's lots of research that shows this, and it's a shocking thing. So here's this my completely mad, frivolous example of how to get people to think more abstractly about this. Take a number, let's divide it by an interesting number, like 499. There comes the mouse. Did you see the mouse? <laughs> and this is a way, look, oh, they can't see, so let's pump it up. It's a bicycle pump. And now we can hold in our hand one 499th. I'm literally holding in my hand, not really, I am now, holding in my hand one 499th as an infinite decimal. And you're going to say to me, when you say infinite decimal, you don't really mean infinite decimal, do you? And my answer, I'm so proud of this, yes. Give me any n and I'll give you a decimal of that length, but you might have to wait some time for it. <laughs> um, it, it is actually called infinite precision arithmetic, and I'm not responsible for it. My computer science colleague, Ken Kahn, is responsible for that. But just, this is my final point. Of course, the, what was going on and what the mouse was doing, who knows, and why, why 499? I'm skating over lots of interesting questions, but the, for me, the interesting question that I want to leave you with is this. We, we had experience with quite young children that just holding this impossibly, infinitely long thing in your hand and saying, I want to do an experiment with it. Why is 1 499th such a different thing to hold in your hand than 1 500th? It really is a different kind of thing. Well, it is and it isn't a different kind of thing. Um, and the moral of the story is what's easy and what's difficult to represent for yourself is at least partly mediated by the way it's represented. And we have ways of representing the knowledge that we all love and care about and want to share with our students in completely new ways. Let's not just waste it by saying, it's open, it's online, let's do it. We can think of more subtle things to do with it. Thanks.